Allosaurus is one of the most famous dinosaurs known, being the predatory mascot for the Morrison Formation and the Jurassic as a whole. But there is one Allosaurus in particular that has been one of the most important specimens of all time for dinosaur paleontology whose life we can actually follow. So let's take a look at Big Al. Back in 1991, a joint team from the Museum of the Rockies and the University of Wyoming Geological Museum began excavation on what they designated as MOR-693, but nicknamed it Big L due to its exceptional preservation and scientific importance. But why is Big L such a big deal? Well, much like Sue the T-Rex, this particular specimen offers an extraordinarily unique insight into the life of the dinosaurian predator. The Big Al specimen, amazingly, is 95% complete, meaning that his reconstruction is one of the most accurate among allosaurs. Big Al measured at around 8 meters or 26 feet long and was assigned as a species of Allosaurus, named A. gymadsomi. Now despite the name, this actually makes Big Al a little smaller than your average Allosaurus. But he wasn't just a petite guy. Histological studies actually show that Big Al was a subadult at around 87% of the way to fully grown and having potentially died at the age of 17. Now, if you'd really like to know what made Big Al such a typical Allosaurus, I did actually go into that in extensive detail here. So I recommend you check that out. What does differentiate Big Al is his bone pathology, which has given us great insights into the kind of life he had. Now the hardcore fans slash flat out disgustingly old people like me may remember the documentary series Walking with Dinosaurs. I am so vibed for the sequel. Specifically, a special they did called The Ballad of Big Al. In this, they looked at the pathology and taphonomy of the animal and speculated about his entire life, including the events that led to these various injuries. Now, I'll get into each event when I go into each individual injury, but just remember that the cause of these is just that speculation. In the special, Al is shown to have been born and following his mother with his siblings. While hunting for insects, the mother leaves them unattended where a one-year-old Allosaurus attacks, killing one of the siblings and highlighting three brutal truths. There will never be 100% of the young that make it to adulthood, unknown members of your own species are very dangerous, and cannibalism happens fairly commonly in nature. As we see Al grow, he learns the nuances of hunting the hard way as well as coming across a predator trap where a dead Stegosaurus is luring other Allosauruses into mud too sticky to escape. It's here that Al avoids this, since as a younger Allosaurus, he's learned that big carcasses like this will attract bigger members of his species, which could be bad news for him. We learn about one of the first potential causes of injury three years later when Al has formed a temporary alliance with other Allosauruses of a similar age to Hunter Diplodocus. Now it's unknown what the gregarious nature of these theropods were, whether they formed official packs or simply temporarily joined forces before fighting each other for the majority of meat before parting ways similar to Komodo dragons. Either way, some kind of teamwork would have been essential for hunting an animal bigger than them. And if there is one thing the Morrison Formation has plenty of, it's huge sauropods. They're eventually successful, but the Diplodocus doesn't go down without a fight, striking Al with his neck. This was the speculated cause of some of the injuries seen on Al's skeleton namely some surface damage to some of the vertebrae on the back and tail. We we'll then catch up with Al a year later, and judging by the reddening on his crests, he's finally hitting sexual maturity. Now for any teenager watching this thinking that hormones are making life tough for you, at least you're not Big Al. As Al comes across a female, he decides to try his luck and turn on the charm, and it, it, it doesn't work. Unfortunately, being both inexperienced and hella horny, Al needs some reminding that no means no, and so is attacked by the female. Again, it's purely speculation about what caused this, but this resulted in injuries paleontologists would later find with broken ribs, a damaged scapula, and a broken finger. And you thought your rejection was tough. Al's rough luck continues as the dry season comes years later, since he receives the injury that ends up being what was likely his death sentence. Whilst chasing down a Drysaurus, Al catches his foot on a log and falls to the ground. This wasn't just a simple stubbing of the toe either, since this breaks slash fractures the metatarsals or the foot bone and phalanges or the toes in two of Al's toes. This results in Al having quite the severe limp, which not only changes the gait enough to predispose the other foot to injury, but for a predator in the wild, 
is a very dire situation. Since Zhao cannot chase down prey, he's going to have to rely on either small, slow and likely non-satiating animals or scavenging from carcasses and simply hope that nothing bigger than him found it first. Given how much fewer and far between Al's meals end up becoming, he enters a vicious cycle of further weakening, meaning he can find even less food. This cycle was also quickened even further when the worst of the break in Al's middle toe became infected with osteomyelitis, eventually swelling the bone painfully through overgrowth of new bone over the course of months. This vicious cycle probably took one too many tolls on poor Al when he eventually collapsed in a dried up riverbed before falling asleep for the last time. Now there was likely a little bit of scavenging on Al's carcass, however it certainly didn't last long as the dry spell came to an end with water flushing and returning to the river, bringing with it the precious sediment that would bury Big Al very quickly, preserving him exquisitely for 145 million years. Now again, I can't stress enough that it is purely speculation as to what caused this on part of the documentary, as well as Big Al's actual sex, since despite the name, we can't actually tell whether or not Big Al was male or female. But nonetheless, the injuries we see were very real and present on the fossil, giving us a great insight into the very harsh life of a predator. Insights like this are incredibly rare and normally result in fossils like Big Al becoming among the more famous, along with Sue, who I talk about here, and another Allosaurus with just as impressive preservation and pathology with the very original name of Big Al II, which also happens to be even more complete and slightly bigger at around 8 metres or 26 feet long. Now this is a specimen that I would absolutely love to see in real life, so if anyone out there has seen it, please let me know what Big Al was like in real life. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to be answering today's question, which comes from Danny Lo D'Souza 6461 who's asked, Hello again, Ryan. How have you been? I've been good, thank you. How are you? Uh, I've recently become aware of a pair of tracks made by a child and a dog around 26,000 years old in France. Then I've read that there's still a debate about when precisely dogs were domesticated. Can methods such as the molecular clock give us a precise date? Or have we fumbled around with our canine companion's genome too much that this is no longer possible? On another note, I'm not sure whether it has anything to do with the fact that I'm a non-native English speaker or not, but the term deep causes me confusion when it is used in an anatomical context, such as deep skull or deep jaws. What exactly does this mean? I may have cheated a bit, including two questions, but that's... Yeah, okay. Brilliant question... Questions. So, first things first, domestication is normally a very gradual process, often stemming from some form of symbiosis. In the case of dogs, it likely stemmed from wolf ancestors following nomadic people and picking up remains gathered by hunters, with the eventual bond growing over a few thousand years. Another aspect is that this almost certainly did not happen simultaneously around the world, so getting more specific than we already have might be impossible at a global scale. As for when this happened, it's generally agreed upon that this happened between 14 to 29,000 years ago, so the footprints in France do fall within those dates. Problem here is that it is seemingly impossible to get any more specific than that. Now, a molecular clock might give some insights, but certainly not conclusive results. For those that don't know, a molecular clock is a term used for calculating the mutation rate for a given species or group using the DNA and RNA sequences, which is often slightly different across the board. Finding this out can tell us roughly when a species or group diverged from their ancestors, which can, in turn, infer a whole plethora of information about their evolution. Now, to call the molecular clock or mutation rate of a species constant is incorrect, but changes to this rate when left alone are very slow, so it's pretty reliable. In the case of dogs, yes we have messed around with this a little bit by selectively breeding individuals who are more prone to mutation than others, but the reason that we were able to breed them so quickly and easily in the first place is that this species is fairly predisposed to a quick mutation rate anyway. Now the reason that I don't think that the answer to this question lies with a molecular clock is because domestication is very different to breeding. Figuring out when we started selectively breeding dogs doesn't actually tell us when we first began bonding with these animals. So I think a better way of answering exactly when within a given continent domestication first happened is by using physical anthropological evidence, which relies solely on just what turns up, which obviously can't be controlled. 
Also, yes, you are cheating, but it's just a quick little one, so I'll let it slide. Skull or jaw depth refers to how tall a skull is relative to its length. So if a skull is relatively deep, it is quite tall and often thick and robust. Whereas if it is relatively shallow, it is proportionately vertically short for its length, appearing a lot more slender. Anyway, I hope this answers your questions as much as I hope that I've gotten a little bit closer to pronouncing your name correctly than I think I did last time. Thank you for submitting that and thank you to everyone else watching this far. The audience that has grown here really, really means a world to me. Don't forget to leave a like if you've enjoyed this and I will catch you guys next time.